Bosanski Novi is a small, beautiful town in northwestern Bosnia, just the width of the emerald green River Una away from the Croatian border. It was home to some 12,000 people before the war, and this is the place where my life began. This is the place where I learned how to be, how to play the accordion, have friends. Even though I haven't lived in Bosanski Novi since 1993, the last two years of my life there certainly defined who I became as a person. This is because I am a survivor of Bosnian genocide that took place between 1992 and 1995. I was 12 at the time, too young to fully comprehend and too old to be oblivious. My parents, like many other Bosnian couples, come from different ethnic and religious backgrounds. My mom is an Orthodox Christian, therefore an ethnic Serb, while my father is a Muslim, an ethnic Bosniak. Neither of them is religious, however, the conflict forced them to be identified along those ethno-religious lines. The part of northwestern Bosnia that we come from was controlled by Serbs from April of 1992, and non-Serbs, mainly Muslims and Croats, were persecuted. So my father, a lawyer by profession, lost his job in spring of 1992 for no other reason except for being a Muslim. Jobless and helpless, he decided to, his, to go to his birth village of Blaga Rijeka, some seven kilometers away from our town to plant some vegetables, hoping that this could help us survive the upcoming winter. As the economic situation was rapidly deteriorating, we knew we couldn't survive on mere eight marks that my mom was earning as a social worker. A few days after he left, the hell erupted. My mom, sister, and I were trapped within the darkness of our fourth floor apartment between shelling, fires, bullets, and sleepless nights. We had no electricity, no running water, no possibilities of moving outside. The shelling lasted the whole night and subsided towards the morning, at which point we saw heavy clouds of smoke hanging above our town. In the days after, we heard that concentration camps were opening around our town. We heard that the shelling mainly targeted non-Serb parts of the town, as well as the Muslim villages located in the Yapra River Valley. We heard that all people from the Yapra River Valley were forced to vacate their homes and were herded onto trains and taken away. We heard that some people were shot under the bridge in Blaga Yapra. We only knew that my father went to this very area. However, we knew nothing of him anymore. We lost all connection. Soon we will find out that during this time, all houses of my uncles were destroyed and burned all of them and their families herded onto trains. Men and women were eventually separated, and men were taken back to Bosanski Novi on trucks and be placed in one of the concentration camps, while women and children were stuffed into boxcars without any windows and sent to the direction city of Doboj. All mosques in the region were also destroyed. The th there were three concentration camps in Bosanski Novi, and men were being held captive in various well-known locations around town, such as the fire station, Hotel Una, and the soccer stadium Sloboda. Its name now sounding rather ironic, given that it translates to freedom. Most people were held captive at the soccer stadium Sloboda, about a thousand of them. All of these men were brought from non-Serb households from Bosanski Novi, as well as the villages from Yapra River Valley. Many of my cousins and uncles were held here for weeks to come. This was the first of the concentration camps that opened in Bosnia, the first of many. Our apartment was located close to the Croatian border and right next to the second of the concentration camp, the one of the fire station. As far as we could tell, fewer men were held there at any given time, but I am not sure how many of them survived given their treatment. We were so close indeed that from our bedroom window, we could hear every night when these men were being tortured and beaten. We could hear that they were being hit by something like sounded, what sounded like chains, and it was followed every time by scr human screams and yelps. My father's first cousin, Razim Grudic, was held there. We would see him when guards would take him and other prisoners chained to one another. Razim did not survive. 
Days were passing and we had no news of my father. After the shelling, a curfew was established and we were allowed to move outside only for a few hours per day. Any chance my mom got, she went out and tried to find information about my dad. One day, a man brought us my dad's watch and said that he was being held at the third of the detention centers, Hotel Una. My mom stormed directly to the hotel and basically went and screamed at the guards who were now at the reception area. She demanded to see my father. She demanded basically that he'd be released given he had not committed any crime. They shooed her away, telling her that she was in no position of authority to decide who would be released and who wouldn't, and that she simply should be happy that he was still alive. But there it was, he was still alive. And for that time being, that simply had to do. My father was held in the cellar of the Hotel Una, in a small windowless room with so many other men that had no place to even sit down. They were given a bucket to use for sanitary purposes. Soldiers would come and take men away, beat them, torture them, then throw them back into the room. The only thing all of these men were guilty of is that they were born into Muslim families. I can't imagine how brave my mother was to go and to confront armed guards at a facility that she understood where people were killed and tortured. I can't even begin to fathom what my father went through. There were other concentration camps in our region, about 30 kilometers away near the city of Priedor, and there many more people were held captive. Thousands of men were killed or they simply died due to malnutrition and torture, and hundreds of women were held in rape camps. The most infamous of those camps were Manyacha, Trinopole, Kerater, and Omarska. After the war, 96 mass graves were found around the city of Priedor, most of them containing at least hundreds, if not more, of piled up bodies. In one of these mass graves, body remains of my uncle, Adam Kenya, were found in 2001. They were positively identified as his in 2002, and he was finally laid to rest in 2004, 12 years after he was killed in the concentration camp Omarska. Somewhat suddenly, in July of 1992, most prisoners were released from concentration camps in Bosanski Novi, as convoy was organized to allow people to leave the area. This was not a kind gesture, as it was part of the Serb policy of ethnic cleansing, to basically make a part of Bosnia ethnically clean from all non-Serbs. But most people of my town understood that leaving sounded a lot better than being killed as many people were being killed in Priedor, like I said, just 30 kilometers away. In order to receive a permit to leave, people had to give all of their property, sign it over to Serbian authorities, including their houses and land, and they had to provide a written statement saying that they would never be coming back. After the first failed attempt in July, on July 16, 1992, the, about 10,000 people left Bosanski Novi a week later on July 23, 1992, escorted by the United Nations. Only a few days after I gained my father back, my mother was shot on July 16, 1992, as she was trying to say goodbyes to numerous friends and family members who were attempting to leave with the first convoy. We don't know who shot her. We only know that she was the only person shot that day. She was wounded in her upper back, a mere centimeter away from her spine. The bullet got lodged and did not penetrate into her lungs, a seemingly minor detail that ended up saving her life. My mom made it out alive, and that's all that matters. However, her bullet wound also meant that we had to stay behind after everybody we knew was leaving. We finally were able to escape a year later in June of 1993. Two buses of people. Before we were allowed to board the buses, we were searched, questioned, and padded. We were not allowed to take with us any pictures, any video recordings, audio recordings, or diaries. Nothing that could in any way be used as evidence for the genocide that was going on. 
As far as we know, we left with the last two buses that were organized with the United Nations to leave our town. We too had to sign all of our property to Serbian authorities. We too had to provide a written statement that we would never be coming back. I wanted to tell you this story tonight mainly for two reasons. First, there are so many genocide deniers out there that in light of all evidence stubbornly claim that mass graves, ethnic cleansing, concentration and rape camps, destruction of cultural heritage and religious objects are somehow not acts of genocide in an attempt to wash their blood-soaked hands or conscience. I wanted to stand here and clearly and loudly say, yes, they are acts of genocide. I am not just a survivor that screams these claims. I am an academic that has spent a good portion of my life researching and teaching about this very topic. Secondly, many of my students come to my history classes believing that the last time the world has seen concentration camps was during the Holocaust, and they believe that genocides are a thing of the past. Yet, since 8 million people died during the Holocaust, many more million died in genocidal activities in places like Bosnia, Rwanda, or Cambodia. And as we sit here and discuss this very issue, the Rohingya of Myanmar are being persecuted and exiled. In 1948, on paper at least, the international community has pledged the never again, as the horrors of the Holocaust became widely known and genocide was proclaimed an international crime. They believe that together, as a world community, we can do better to prevent such atrocities from happening ever again. Yet here I stand here to tell you that again and again they were wrong and they failed. This does raise, however, a rather important question. Why don't we do more to prevent and stop genocides? The most common answer to this question is the one of political inertia, usually explained with inabilities or unwillingness of governments to send necessary peacekeeping missions to critical areas. Politicians often argue over semantics, whether a conflict is similar enough to, gen uh, to Holocaust to be labeled a genocide and therefore warrant an international response. While they argue, innocents get killed. The less common answer to this question of whether and why we don't prevent uh, genocides lies in the necessary discussion of the importance of personal responsibility of each and every citizen when it comes to such awful awful events. After all, genocides are local events of global importance, and therefore it is imperative to understand why don't we do more to help fellow human beings in need when they're faced with such awful realities. It turns out that us humans have very difficult times like scaling our emotions appropriately and understanding radical figures. So when we hear that one person lost their life, we can comprehend that. However, when I say 800,000 people were killed within 90 days, that roughly translate to six people being killed every single minute. To us, this is simply a meaningless statistics. We don't know what to do with that. Understanding catastrophes of such magnitude requires careful thinking, analysis, and emotional involvement. In other words, it requires hard work. Most humans aren't used to thinking in these ways and therefore resort to mild reactions, distance, em emotional distance, and therefore disinterest. Additionally, we're all, to some extent, guilty of engaging in authority worship. We believe that our government is doing the right thing. We believe that they know better than we do on our individual levels. And all too often, we equate legality with morality. We assume that all laws are just and moral. And therefore, when authorities are harming someone, we assume that that person has committed an illegal act, a wrong act, and therefore deserves such treatment. When in truth, Laws often have nothing to do with morality. So many laws in American history alone were so immoral. Fugitive Slave Act, 
Indian Removal Act, Jim Crow laws, just to name a few. Currently, many Americans are supporting or at least excusing the inhumane treatment of illegal immigrant children that are separated from their parents and held in facilities all over the country. Their illegal status certainly suggests their criminal doing and therefore wrongness. Deep down, this has nothing to do with morality. It may have, it may have something to do with power, but not with morality, as we all know that it is always the right thing to help a fellow human being in need, especially the vulnerable one, regardless of their immigration status or any status for that matter. And finally, we are all guilty of bystander apathy. We don't feel responsible to stop the wrongdoers when we see things happening, most likely because everyone around us is not doing anything either. So we just simply stand and look on. This is all too often seen in videos posted to social media when children are being beaten at schools and the groups just simply stands by, looks on, and nobody wants to step outside of the group and look like somewhat different and want to help the victim. The truth is, we would do the same if genocide was happening in our country, our state, or our town. Unless we were personally targeted, we would simply stand by. We would not want to do anything that the majority of people aren't doing. We would turn around and mind our own business. And every single time, we would be wrong in doing so. As an educator, I feel responsible to influence the members of our society to engage in hard thinking, to stop and question the morality of laws and actions, to not always do the easy thing. I believe we need to teach more about genocide. We need to foster deeper and broader understanding that most perpetrators of genocide were not monsters and sociopaths. They were simply humans who did the easy thing, not the right thing. Why does any of this matter? Because, believe it or not, it can be us. Just like genocides could happen in democratic Germany, Bosnia, or Rwanda, it can happen here, or anywhere else for that matter. And what we can do is be aware. We can choose to pay attention. We can choose not to turn our heads away. We can choose to get emotionally involved. We can choose to question morality of actions and laws. We can choose to be that one person that did the right thing. Thank you.